So uh, welcome. I'm delighted to introduce uh, Sarah Matthew to you. Sarah is Associate Professor at the School of Human Evolution and Social Change at Arizona State. She investigates why humans, unlike other animals, cooperate in groups comprising large numbers of genetically unrelated individuals and how the evolution of this unique form of cooperation is tied to the origins of moral sentiments, cultural norms, and warfare. To address these issues, she combines formal modeling of the evolution of cooperation with field work to test theories of how cooperation is sustained. She's been running a field project in Kenya among the Turkana, a pastoral society. Through systematic empirical studies in this unique ethnographic context, she has, um, her work sheds light on how and at what social scale humans solve the collective action problem in war warfare without hierarchical formal military institutions. Sarah is the recipient of an Andrew Carnegie Fellowship, which is a $200,000 award given to scholars identified as among the country's most creative thinkers to support research on challenges to democracy and international order. So we're really, really delighted to have Sarah along with us today. Um, so Sarah will talk for 45 minutes or an hour, and then we'll open it up to a general que um, question and answer period. But she's indicated to me that if you have questions of clarification throughout the talk, um, you can just post them in the chat and I'll, um, and I'll raise them with her. Okay, so without further ado, uh, I'd like to welcome Sarah first and then to turn it over to her. Welcome, Sarah. Thank you. Thanks everyone for having me and thanks for the introduction. Okay. So uh, I'll be talking about the cultural evolution of cooperative um, norms. And um, I think we can all agree that cooperation is a bit of an evolutionary puzzle. So um, individuals who are providing a benefit at a cost to themselves are going to do worse uh, than individuals who are taking those benefits, uh, but not paying the cost. So there are two solutions to this in, um, in evolutionary biology, kin selection and reciprocity. So in kin selection, cooperators are preferentially directing um, their cooperative acts towards close kin. Um, and by doing so, cooperators can have an evolutionary advantage. And in reciprocity, they are um, directing their um, acts of cooperation towards individuals who cooperated with them in the past. Uh, and as a result, most of the cooperation in the animal kingdom is restricted to groups of um, uh, well-known individuals, small groups of kin. But uh, we know that human cooperation So we know that human cooperation doesn't easily fit into this pattern. And um, that is because humans cooperate in large groups of unrelated individuals. And um, one question, uh, one intuition we might have is that this is the result, the spectacular kind of cooperation we display is the result of political centralization, formal institutions, governments that uh, can coerce people into cooperating, can enforce the rule of law. Uh, and so in order to understand what is the scale and scope of human cooperation, when we don't have these um, political, uh, centralized political formal institutions, I've been working with a pastoral population up in northern Kenya uh, called the Turkana, as Dennis mentioned. And uh, so they are, um, they number about a million people. So the area in pink on the top left is um, the uh, area that the Turkana occupy. And the red dot up here is the air, rough area in which I conduct my field work. And as you can see, it's quite close to the border with South Sudan. Sorry, lots of notifications. Um, and uh, the Turkana are making a living herding cattle, camel, sheep, goat, and donkey, and they're living in a semi-arid savanna habitat in which they are limited by access to dry season water wells and grazing lands. And um, as a result, they um, live in temporary settlements and they periodically migrate um, to new areas to find uh, fresh pastures and uh, watering sites for their animals. The Turkana also engage in cattle raids against neighboring groups. And uh, the 
key purpose of these raids is to acquire livestock to replenish their herds. Their herds uh, are often depleted in droughts, um, disease epidemics, and uh, also in raids that have been launched against them by neighboring groups. And it's also a very important way for the Turkana to get access to dry season uh, grazing lands and to dry season water wells. So there is a collective action problem in these raids. Um, so individuals are bearing substantial costs um, to go on these raids. So just to give you an idea of these costs, um, about 40% of the warriors in my sample had sustained bullet injuries. The average mortality on each raid is about 1%, and this is a pretty high mortality rate. Um, about 50% of adult male mortality is from warfare. This is a combination of offensive and defensive warfare. It's roughly divided between the two, the mortality. And one-fifth of all male children born die in warfare. Now, these are numbers that uh, are from the sample of people I work with who are very close to the border. It's not going to be true for all of Turkana. But in this population that's living and using uh, grazing lands that are close to the border with other uh, pastoral groups, individuals are bearing these kinds of costs. And yet, the benefits are um, not just flowing to the individuals who are participating. So for example, grazing land um, is, a, is a communally held uh, property. And so anyone can settle um, in those grazing lands once the um, Turkana have uh, occupied that area. And uh, the livestock that's acquired, so you might get uh, hundreds or even thousands of livestock in a successful raid. Um, and uh, the uh, that uh, loot can also be had by individuals who haven't contributed um, the optimal um, level of fighting that needs to be um, done in order for the raiding party to be successful. So um, there is potential for individuals to free ride, to, be, uh, to display cowardice on the battlefield, um, etc. And uh, despite the fact that this is a high stakes uh, form of cooperation in which individuals are risking their lives, um, the raiding parties are very large in size. Um, on average, there are about 300 warriors who go on these raids. Some raids are even bigger, up to 1,000 warriors. And um, for, uh, in my estimate, an individual warrior has only about 1% of the raiding party be his close kin. And many of the warriors in a raiding party are unfamiliar to him. So he might know people from his own settlement, his own territory, but there could be several people um, who he does not, um, he's not familiar with. So um, it's clear that uh, something like kin selection and reciprocity is um, very inadequate to explain the kinds of cooperation we're seeing in human societies even when you don't have political centralization and formal institutions. Um, and uh, what uh, seems to be uh, an important motivator for individuals um, to contribute to these raids um, and incentivize participation in these raids is peer sanctioning. So um, uh, regular Turkana citizens are um, are motivated to express moral punitive um, judgments and sentiments towards those who um, free ride on these raids. And um, for instance, uh, these are results from one vignette experiment that I've done in which um, I presented um, subjects, um, members from the Turkana community with uh, an account of a um, hypothetical Turkana raid in which uh, a warrior who joins the raid uh, is a laggard. He lags behind others. He doesn't fire his weapon and he runs away when the firefight begins. So he's basically displaying um, cowardice on the battlefield. And uh, I've asked them uh, various questions that elicit their, um, their uh, moral judgments towards this individual. So as you can see, a substantial number of people think that the act um, was wrong 
they're displeased with this warrior. They would want to criticize him. They would think he, sh he they think he should be punished. They don't want to stand next to him in a raid. They wouldn't want to entrust their herds with him. They won't lend him an animal. Um, a substantial number of people are saying that they uh, uh, will refuse him an animal at a time in which he needs and is going to um, be asking them for help. They won't let their daughter marry this person. And um, if you are a subsistence pastoralist, um, uh, you know, if you're less likely to receive help at a time of need when your herds have been depleted, uh, this can have really serious uh, consequences. And um, uh, they don't have these sentiments towards um, a warrior who was presented as an unskilled warrior. So here in blue, I have people's um, attitudes towards a warrior who goes on a raid, uh, puts in the effort, but because he was not a skilled warrior, he actually wasn't able to contribute to the firefight and help his um, team be successful. So in some ways, both uh, the coward and the unskilled warrior have similar effects on the raiding party, uh, but people have very different reactions um, to them. They much more strongly socially disapprove of the coward's action. And that suggests that uh, these sentiments, um, uh, these either the norms or the moral psychology itself, is much uh, is attuned towards free riding behavior. So that is when individuals are reducing the cost that they're experiencing um, in a um, collective enterprise, in a joint enterprise. Um, and these uh, moral punitive sentiments do lead to real sanctions, um, not all the time, but in uh, many instances. So uh, the different forms of sanctions um, that I show here are uh, verbal sanctions, which is usually the first level of sanctioning. Basically, you're admonished, um, you're criticized, you're ridiculed by your peers and others in your community. And in about half of the instances um, the, in my sample, these resulted in more um, severe forms of punishment, including corporal punishment and fines. So in corporal punishment, um, a group of your age mates get together and they beat or whip uh, the person who's um, violated the norm. So here's um, somebody who has scars from um, many years ago when he was beaten for not doing pre-raid um, duties. So this is in cowardice, but other duties that people are expected to perform um, for the raiding party before the raid departs. And um, this is an example of um, a fine where a bunch of people have gathered together, discussed um, uh, uh, wrongdoing. In this case, the wrongdoing um, was about stealing animals from another member of your community. And uh, they uh, decide on a fine, uh, a number of animals that um, the wrongdoer needs to um, kill for um, atoning for this, um, uh, this crime. And um, uh, uh, such kinds of fines are a common way in which people um, sanction individuals who've been cowards and deserters on raids. Um, so, uh, uh, if you noticed, there are many instances in which people also don't sanction. So there are wrongdoings that don't end up getting sanctioned. And there are many reasons for this. And one reason um, that I'll highlight um, is, is um, illustrated in this quote here. So the subject who talked about um, having had a coward um, on a raid, uh, and uh, reported that he didn't end up getting punished, their age mates didn't punish him. And his reasoning for this was that, well, he may be a friend that donates as a goat the next time we go on a raid, uh, or we may marry their family. And so what he's highlighting is the second order free rider problem, wherein uh, punishment, uh, to engage in third party punishment, uh, is costly. There's the cost of time, there's the cost of the effort, but most importantly, there's also the cost of severing certain um, social ties that may turn out to be important. 
uh, while you can get the benefits um, of social, the social order, uh, even if you're not participating in punishment. So that brings me to the first of three questions that I'm going to, um, to present uh, at this talk. Um, so why do people punish? Uh, so we know that sanctioning norm enforcement can sustain cooperation. That's consistent with a large body of literature, uh, and I've shown it in a naturalistic uh, high stakes context in, in the field. Um, but why are people motivated to punish? And um, to explore basically whether there are um, meta norms that govern norm enforcement behavior, I've done a series of vignette experiments that I will um, show to you. So in this first uh, set of uh, vignette experiments, I've presented people with a scenario in which a warrior goes on a raid, uh, observes somebody being a coward, and uh, then reports um, and, and doesn't punish, um, doesn't come back, report that behavior to others, doesn't initiate um, sanctions. So that's gonna be shown in blue. And I've contrasted that with a very similar scenario in which somebody observes a violation, um, but um, uh, doesn't initiate the punishment or does, I forget which one I said, but in yellow, it's the person initiates punishment, in blue, the person does not initiate punishment. And people express a very um, strong social disapproval for the individual who did not initiate punishment. So the, for the person who's acted like a second order free rider. And uh, some of these sentiments are very similar to what they've expressed uh, towards the first order free rider. And they don't have some, these sentiments towards somebody who took the right um, action and went ahead to initiate the process of punishment. So that suggests that there are meta norms that um, make people obliged to appropriately sanction um, cowardice. And that's not all there is. So the turns out that the meta norms are more complex than that. Um, so in orange, I have a scenario in which the warrior observes a wrongdoing, but uh, initiates sanctions uh, that were too severe for the crime. Uh, and in red, um, somebody who falsely accuses someone and initiates punishment against them. And you can see that there's strong social disapproval um, for those actions. So it's not just that there are norms um, that are promoting people to engage in punishment, it's that there are norms in this society at least um, that are promoting engagement in pro-social punishment. And um, there are also uh, norms about how, um, uh, not just what the punisher can do, but the individual who's being punished uh, can do. So um, in blue, is um, people's response to an individual who was punished, who then initiated, um, who retaliated against his punisher for sanctions that he had deserved. Uh, and people socially disapprove of that, but uh, they don't socially disapprove of somebody who's um, retaliating against his punisher for undeserved sanctions. So, um, uh, it does seem like there, there are a complex uh, slew of meta norms that are governing punishment behavior. And before I leave off, I'll highlight one more that I think is very interesting. So this is um, uh, uh, what I'm showing over here is the difference in proportion of subjects who judge a punisher's act as wrong if either the punisher benefits from the action. So in, you know, instead of corporal punishment, if the punisher is um, extorting an animal, if the punisher is a third party to the violation, so didn't observe, didn't, wasn't, wasn't there, but uh, heard about it and initiate sanctions. If the punisher is not from a preordained group, so in the uh, Trakana um, uh, system, age, age mates are supposed to initiate sanctions against uh, cowards. And what I had here was the, uh, a senior age group member kind of um, oversteps and um, uh, without consulting with the uh, 
with the violator's own age mates, he initiates sanctions. And uh, last, um, if the punisher acts alone. And as you can see, one of the strongest disapprovals um, came if the punisher acts on his own. And what's really interesting about this is that in these scenarios, the punisher was following all of those, was complying with all of these meta norms that I just showed you previously. So the punisher observed the violation, initiated the right amount of sanctions, and it was a justified punishment. Yet, if the punisher acts on his own, people um, very strongly expressed that uh, if you're doing that, then it's a personal fight. It's a grudge. It's not about correcting. It's not about disciplining uh, an individual. And um, one of the things, uh, one aspect of this that I find interesting is that in the literature, uh, in the theory, uh, people have as, uh, assumed that the collective nature of punishment has more to do with reducing the cost for punishers for engaging in third party punishment. Um, but what the uh, perspective uh, from these results suggest is that it has less to do with people don't view a lone punisher as somebody who's very altruistic and taking on this important job on his own. They rather are um, suspicious, they, they don't trust the motives of, of a punisher who's going to act alone, and only the collective um, consensus decision making system uh, conveys to them that um, the motives here are about disciplining. And that's um, what happens when people are discussing uh, what to do with a wrongdoing, many people do bring up case, uh, you know, reasons why this person should be not punished this time. They might say this was the first time, or they might say this person was very generous in some other context. Um, so um, people bring up circumstances um, that, that might be important to take into consideration before um, deciding on whether somebody should be punished or not. So I'll uh, end this first part by saying that the, um, what I've shown is um, evidence supporting the fact that the Chakana have culturally evolved norms and meta norms that mitigate the second order free rider problem and promote pro-social punishment. Interestingly, there aren't reports of actual punishment of second order free riders. Um, so even though there are, there's so, social disapproval, people are, um, uh, uh, unlike in the case of first order free riding where you actually do see punishment, uh, nobody's ever said that you know, somebody who's done this has actually been punished. And um, I can talk more about this in the Q&A, but I think this has a, a bit to do with the fact that second order free riding is a crime of omission rather than a crime of commission. And that um, could impact uh, at the way that punishment actually gets implemented. So um, the next part of my talk, I'm going to focus on how these norms evolve. So we know that once you have these norms, people are motivated to um, engage in pro-social punishment and you can get informal norms that are creating a system of um, in which uh, fair um, punishment is being meted out towards wrongdoers. Uh, and the power and authority to do that is vested in every individual's um, hands. So a decentralized form of justice. Um, and so, but how do these norms um, actually arise and how do they spread? How do they persist? And um, uh, to answer that question, I'm going to actually tackle a slightly different question, which is what explains the scale of cooperation? Because uh, when we think about evolutionary mechanisms, one of the um, easiest way to try to understand what evolutionary process is underlying um, uh, some phenomenon that we're exploring is to understand what is the scale at which um, People, those cooperative benefits are being experienced. So for instance, kin selection predicts that individuals um, cooperation should be at the scale of close kin. Reciprocity predicts that cooperation should be at the scale of pairs of individuals who know each other well. 
And um, uh, in, with the case of humans, we know the mechanism, we know that norms are able to sustain cooperation, but uh, what is the scale of cooperation being sustained by norms? Because sanctions and norms can sustain a wide range of outcomes, a wide range of cooperative outcomes at very different scales. So you could have a norm that says, don't steal your village members cattle, but the cattle of other villages, those are for brave people to steal. Or you could have a norm that says, don't steal your clan members cattle, but the cattle of other clans are for brave warriors to steal. And both of these norms uh, can get enforced through all the mechanisms that I've just described, but they would produce cooperation at very different scales one at the scale of villages, the other at the scale of clans. And um, to motivate this point a little further, um, I'll uh, talk about one more vignette experiment that I've done here. Um, so the, the folks that I work with um, are a subsection of the Turkana called the Quartella. So I presented the Quartella subjects uh, with a vignette scenario in which two Quartella warriors go off to Toposa land, that's the neighboring ethnolinguistic group, and they raid animals from the Toposa, they bring it back to Quartella and they share it with the Quartella who are the subjects um, who are responding to this vignette scenario. And uh, I uh, I compared the response um, to this situation with the response to a situation in which two Turkana warriors go and raid animals from another Turkana territory, the Lukumong. Um, and uh, in this case too, the Quartella are benefiting, the warriors come back, they're sharing the animals with the Quartella, yet the Quartella subjects had very different responses to these two situations. Even though they benefited in um, the situation uh, where another territorial section was raided, they were strongly disapproving of the actions of those warriors and they felt that those warriors need to be punished, um, et cetera. And they don't have these sentiments towards the warriors who are going to Toposa land um, to get um, cattle. In fact, they have very positive um, uh, views of these warriors who go to Toposa. So, um, so in the case um, uh, here, what we have is um, there's something, we have moral norms um, that the Quartella have moral norms that include the Lukumong, but don't include the Toposa. Um, and in this particular case, it seems like the ethno-linguistic boundary is important. Um, but the question is, why is the ethno-linguistic boundary important? Um, and is that a recurring pattern across human societies? And how can we uh, use these patterns to infer what are the selective forces that are shaping the evolution of norms? So uh, one theory that makes a prediction about uh, what is the scale at which um, large scale cooperative norms um, uh, should um, sustain cooperative outcomes is cultural group selection theory. So cultural group selection theory posits that um, competition between groups with different cultural norms and institutions will lead to the spread of norms or institutions that benefit the cultural group. So um, uh, the theory makes two predictions. One is that the between group cultural variation is going to be higher than between group genetic variation because we know that between group genetic variation is not sufficient to get cooperation to occur in these large uh, scales. There's just not enough variation. Um, in uh, genetic variation between populations. And um, second, that the scale of cooperation then should coincide with the scale of cultural similarity. That is, people should be motivated to cooperate um, with individuals who share their cultural beliefs, norms, um, ideas. So to do this, we uh, used a metric uh, called cultural FST to um, to measure the, uh, the extent of between group variation there is. So a cultural FST is between group variation and cultural traits divided by the total variation, which is the sum of individual variation and between group variation. 
So the higher this number is, uh, the more of the variation in cultural traits occurs between groups. And if it's uh, low, uh, most of the variation is between individuals. It's not structured into um, groups. So to illustrate that logic a little bit more, uh, let's imagine, um, uh, so humans live in these nested social groups. Um, so let's imagine uh, two ethno-linguistic groups um, that I've shown here with uh, nested, um, that have clans within them, okay? So um, if most of the cultural variation lies between clans, then cultural group selection is going to mostly act at the clan level, and that's going to favor the evolution of cooperative norms that promote clan level cooperation, even if it comes at the expense of other clans. But if most of the cultural variation is between ethno-linguistic groups, then the strongest uh, selection, cultural group selection is going to be between ethno-linguistic groups. And that should lead to um, the evolution of norms that, um, that promote cooperation across clans for the benefit of the ethno-linguistic group, um, even if it's at the expense of other ethno-linguistic groups. So um, to do this, I've collaborated with Carla Handley, who was a postdoc uh, with me at ASU at the time. And we did three things. We measured cultural differentiation at multiple social scales. Uh, and we assessed the social scales at which individuals cooperate, and we mapped cultural differentiation and cooperation to see if they correspond as you would expect from cultural group selection theory. So uh, Carla had been working for um, 13 years at that time with three pastoral populations who were neighbors of the Chakana, the Samburu, um, the Borana, and the Rendile. So in combination with the Turkana, we had four neighboring pastoral groups um, that we could um, assess this question in. And all of these groups were politically decentralized natural fertility populations competing intensively for livestock, grazing territory, water resources. And uh, they all participate in um, engage in intergroup raids that affect the access to resources, grazing lands, and in turn, their population growth. So in some sense, this is a very suitable context to examine how bottom-up processes um, can, uh, can yield uh, certain normative outcomes. So we sampled 750 individuals from these four populations. Um, and they came uh, from nine different clans, three clans of the Turkana and two of the Rendele, Samburu, Burana each. And um, the Turkana additionally have this territorial subdivision, um, which is a geography based as opposed to a descent based uh, grouping. And so we additionally sampled in individuals from three different um, territorial sections. And um, to measure cultural variation, we identified 49 cultural traits, um, so cultural norms or beliefs, and we ask subjects if they agree or disagree uh, with these um, norms. So if they agree, they have the cultural trait. If they disagree, they don't have that particular cultural trait. Um, and to measure the scale of cooperation, we developed 16 vignette scenarios, realistic vignette scenarios of actual um, situations that people might encounter. Uh, in these um, in these cultural systems um, of helping or um, some of those scenarios were not of helping per se, but of not harming. So refraining from harming, which is also a very important aspect of um, cooperation. And we varied uh, whether the target is an individual from the same clan as the actor, different clan as the actor, a different ethnic group as the actor, and in the case of the Chakana, also a different territorial section as the actor. And uh, what we find is that uh, cultural FST values, especially between ethno-linguistic groups, are quite substantial. Um, our 
an order of magnitude higher than genetic FST estimates from the literature. Now, these genetic FST estimates are not of these populations, but of other populations that uh, researchers had um, data on. Um, but what we're seeing is that about 8 to 20 percent of the variation in cultural traits um, occurs between ethnolinguistic groups. And uh, you don't get that much uh, structure uh, between clans or between territorial sections. Um, so the, the values of FST values over here are um, more on the order of magnitude that we see um, with genetic uh, FST estimates. So what we've shown with this is that there is scope for cultural group selection. There's much greater scope for cultural group selection than there is for genetic group selection. So cultural group selection is a plausible um, theoretical um, idea for how um, human cooperation, large scale cooperation could have evolved. Um, and the second part of this uh, study where we examined whether, uh, was to examine whether you know, this uh, cultural population structure has resulted in between group competition that has actually favored cooperative norms of the type that we would expect. And so what we found is that it does. So first I'm gonna show you um, uh, a control, which is um, uh, the, the geographic distance didn't have a big effect on uh, whether people would endorse the cooperative act. So the fact that you're living near somebody didn't make you more likely to endorse um, cooperation with those individuals. But we did see a strong and significant effect of cultural FST on endorsements for cooperation. So uh, as the cultural FST value increased, that means um, the groups become more culturally different um, the rate at which people were endorsing the cooperative action uh, reduced. So this suggests that um, uh, for, for one, the first graph suggests that measurements of cultural variation between ethnolinguistic groups are higher than available genetic FSD measurements, making it a plausible explanation for how norms are evolving. And um, the scales at which individuals cooperate does map on to variation in cultural relatedness, which is what you would expect if this process was in fact shaping norms. So um, cultural group selection might be influencing the evolution of cooperative norms. And the implication of that um, in a broader sense is that culture has relieved one major constraint on the evolution of cooperation. Um, and it would confer humans with cooperative norms and moral institutions um, that uh, allow us to cooperate in large groups, but would still tend to be culturally parochial. So that's a, that's a limit um, on what this mechanism can do. So um, I will move now to the third part of my talk, um, which is exploring the role of um, culturally evolved social norms in sustaining pairwise cooperation in humans. So um, one of the big, uh, when people have thought about human cooperation, a lot of the focus has been on humans capacity to cooperate in large groups of genetically unrelated individuals, uh, because that's a clear um, difference between um, uh, human cooperation and non-human cooperation. Uh, but there hasn't been as much attention uh, paid to another phenomenon, which is um, the, the stark difference between the levels of pairwise cooperation that humans exhibit and the levels of pairwise cooperation that we see in other animals. So um, uh, I uh, will describe what I think is a puzzle, uh, a puzzle of missing cooperation in nature. So the uh, main explanation for how you can get cooperation to evolve, uh, aside from kin selection, was repeated interactions and reciprocity. So uh, essentially, 
if individuals interact repeatedly and people uh, preferentially direct the benefits of cooperation to those who have cooperated with them in the past, uh, the theory, standard reciprocity theory, predicts that you should get quite a lot of cooperation, high stakes cooperation, um, uh, similar to, even similar to what you should get between close kin. And um, the conditions for such reciprocity to evolve are actually present in several group living animals. So um, a lot of, um, many animals live in stable social groups in which they can individually recognize other individuals of their uh, other um, uh, group members. And uh, they seem to have the cognitive ability to uh, respond uh, behaviorally respond in a flexible way uh, based on how a group member has treated them in the past, which is what um, you, uh, what most animals do in dominance hierarchies. Um, they know when to be subordinate, who to be subordinate to. They're aware of when the dominance hierarchy has changed. And all of this is the type of cognition that you would require to be able to keep track of what somebody did to you in the past and to direct aid towards those who cooperated with you. But there's sparse evidence outside of humans for costly pairwise cooperation between unrelated individuals. So you do get a lot of, um, most of the evidence for reciprocity in non-human animals is in the context of low stakes exchange. So grooming interactions or tolerance of another individual at a feeding site. But you don't get the kinds of high stakes uh, high cost, high benefit forms of uh, pairwise cooperation that characterizes humans, uh, human relationships. Um, so you don't get, uh, there's very limited evidence for division of labor and trade uh, between pairs of individuals of um, active food sharing um, of mutual aid. So helping an injured animal, for instance, provisioning an injured um, individual. Um, so these are uh, the types of pairwise interactions that are omnipresent in human societies, but are um, uh, oddly missing in, um, in lots of social animals. And um, interestingly, in humans, uh, cooperation in pairwise interactions is embedded within cultural norms. So we have lots of norms about um, friendship, there are norms about marriage um, partnerships, there are norms uh, about how um, the relationship between employer and employee, and these are basically repeated interactions between pairs of individuals that potentially don't require the scaffolding of uh, norms and norm enforcement um, to actually um, uh, be maintained. Um, so in some sense, it's odd that these are so deeply, so many of these pairwise interactions are deeply embedded within cultural norms. So uh, one possibility is that there is some barrier for the evolution of reciprocity that in humans is being alleviated through norms and third party moral interventions. So uh, in, col uh, in collaboration with Rob Boyd at ASU, um, I've been exploring how perception errors could be um, the solution um, to this. So how could perception errors be the barrier? Um, so perception errors occur uh, when um, players have different beliefs about what transpired. So you mistakenly defect. Um, you think that you cooperated, but your partner perceives a defection. And uh, under these kinds of errors, um, cooperation can collapse. Um, and um, uh, as a result, uh, oh, we don't have too many solutions for how you can recover cooperation when perception errors occur. There are some solutions, some strategies that work when perception error rates are low. Uh, but one possibility is that in real life, perception errors could actually be quite common. Um, so in theory and in experiments, we have a fixed B and a fixed C. 
Uh, but in, in real life, there isn't a fixed BNC. The costs and the benefits are going to vary uh, across interactions. They're going to occur in different currencies. They're going to depend on states of an individual that's not known to the partner. Um, and uh, they're going to be based on um, incomplete information about your partner's expectations. And this is a problem even in formal contracts, but it's so much more exacerbated when you don't actually have explicit um, contracts. Uh, and uh, evolution can have favored self-serving biases and causal attribution and judgments of fairness, all of which could uh, mean that perception errors are in fact a very common occurrence um, in cooperative relationships. So we've uh, explored whether adjudication by third parties can help resolve perception errors. So to do that, we introduced a strategy um, called arbitration tit for tat, ATFT. And um, in an iterated prisoner's dilemma, what ATFT does is it cooperates if um, uh, its partner is in good standing or if itself, um, if you are in bad standing and Otherwise you defect. Everyone starts in good standing, remains in good standing if they play by ATFT rules. Uh, if ATFT perceives a defection that violates the ATFT rules, um, such as a mistaken defection, then um, you call on a third party to judge if the defection actually occurred. And once the uh, adjudicator makes a decision, the ATFT player aligns its beliefs with the arbitrator's decision. So two players using that public signal of uh, given by the arbitrator, two players who had different beliefs about what happened can align their beliefs and go on to uh, resume, uh, recover from this error. So um, to give you a better sense of uh, how uh, the strategy works, so um, let's imagine um, uh, two players, one called focal, one I call partner, and uh, they're playing. Uh, they are both in good standing, and so they've both cooperated. Um, and in this next round is when an er error occurs. So the focal defects in, uh, intended to cooperate and thought focal thinks that she cooperated, but um, it was actually a defection. So a uh, partner perceives a defection. And so a uh, partner uh, calls the third party arbitrator. And uh, if the arbitrator rules that the focal did in fact defect, so here the arbitrator is accurate, um, then what happens is that the player who made the error goes into bad standing. And when somebody is in bad standing, you can defect on them without it affecting your own standing. So your partner gets to defect on you and still remain in good standing. And um, as a result, the pair can quickly um, resume cooperation, recover uh, cooperation after this error. If the arbitrator is wrong um, and actually ruled that the focal cooperated, what happens is that the person who invoked arbitrator, the arbitrator without cause goes into bad standing and um, the focal player gets to defect without losing their own standing. And um, after one round, uh, you get uh, cooperation reestablished. So what we've found um, is that ATFT is an evolutionally stable strategy in a range of plausible conditions. Uh, importantly, ATFT can reestablish cooperation even when errors arise frequently. So uh, previous um, strategies could do this when error rates were between uh, one, two, three, uh, or up to 5%, but ATFT can handle error rates up to 50%. Um, and what we found is that uh, arbitration for ATFT to be evolutionally stable, arbitration can be imperfect. So you don't need to have 100% accuracy by the arbitrators, but it cannot be random. So 
you can't, um, a solution can't be that you flip a coin and decide who was right and move on. Um, the, the arbitrator's decision has to somehow um, even imperfectly track what has actually um, happened. And um, we also examined what happens when uh, arbitration is costly um, uh, or if arbitration is biased in favor of certain individuals. And we found that ATFT can be evolutionally stable even in these conditions, although um, the, the range is a little bit more restrictive. So um, here are um, some results. So what, um, what we have on the x-axis here is the perception error rates. Um, so 0.5 would be up to 50%. And over here, what we have is the accuracy of the arbitrator. So at, at 0.5, the arbitrator is basically like a coin flip. So between, and one is when the arbitrator is perfectly accurate. And what you can see is that, and what I'm showing here is um, in this region over here above these curves, is um, the region in which ATFT has a higher fitness than a deviant who defects uh, when both players are in good standing. So when ATFT is cooperating, uh, you uh, examine what is the payoff of a deviant who defects. And this is the parameter combinations of arbitration accuracy and error rate in which ATFT would be evolutionally stable. Um, and same here, under different values, uh, ratios of B and C, under different continuation probabilities. So here, some of the most restrictive arbitration accuracy conditions we're seeing is somewhere around 0.8, a little bit more than point, um, uh, up to 0.9 over here. Um, this is um, showing you the conditions under which ATFT has higher fitness than a deviant who does not call the arbitrator when its partner defects and instead just goes ahead and cooperates. So it's ignoring a defection and moving on without calling the arbitrator. Um, so an overly cooperative deviant. And uh, again, what you see is that there are a range of arbitration accuracies in which uh, ATFT would be evolutionally stable. And under some of the most restrictive conditions, again, arbitration accuracy needs to be around 0.8. Um, and here um, I'm showing what happens uh, when arbitration comes at a cost. So when K is 0.5, it means that the cost um, of invoking the arbitrators, but is half the cost of cooperation. So it's 0.5 times C. And uh, again, um, it, uh, there, there, uh, there's a range of conditions, there's a range of arbitration accuracy and error rates under which ATFT can do better than a cheetah strategy that intentionally defects uh, with some probability or against an ex a tolerant strategy. So a strategy that ignores defection, doesn't call the arbitrator and just goes ahead and cooperates. So overall, um, this suggests that um, ATFT or some type of strategy that um, utilizes third party arbitration um, to align players' beliefs, even if it's not exactly ATFT, um, is potentially a way to solve the problem of frequent perception errors. And um, so what we would um, argue is that um, this could help explain why reciprocity is so much more common, why costly forms of reciprocity are so much more common in humans, because humans um, have the possibility of calling on adjudicators who actually might have some knowledge about what happening between two players because humans are paying a lot of attention to um, norm compliance by others in order to socially learn what the, what the norms are and to engage in third-party monitoring behavior uh, that is required for norm enforcement. So you have all these people around who, who um, uh, have some knowledge about uh, what's going on and can help resolve disagreements uh, between others. 
but this is uh, but other species don't have um, the similar pool of uh, third party arbitrators who could uh, provide information to players. Um, and so that precludes strategies like ATFT that can resolve frequent perception errors that arise. And um, the benefits of third party adjudication can explain um, why pairwise relationships in humans are not maintained by threat of defection alone. Um, so friendships, marriage partnerships, relationships between employer and employee. Um, uh, on the one hand, you can think the threat of defection alone is sufficient to maintain cooperation in these um, relationships, but um, uh, in some ways, these uh, the fact that they're governed so much by social norms could indicate that they do require the scaffolding of third party judgments and shared social norms in order to um, solve the problem of perception errors. So um, I will end there and leave um, time for Q&A, but I want to acknowledge um, the host communities, the Turkana, Borana, Rendili, and Samburu communities um, who have allowed um, and participated in the data collection and various field assistants uh, from these communities who've um, uh, helped with translations and with data collection, and uh, the collaborators on projects that I've discussed here, Carla Handley and Rob Boyd, and uh, many funding organizations. Thank you. So I will end my screen share. Thank you, Sarah. I'm sure there'll be many, many questions. Okay. So may I ask those of you with questions to raise your virtual hands, please. I'll be able to see you in the, in the chat panel or the, the other panel, anyway, um, the participants panel. And uh, our first question comes from one of our SRI graduate fellows, Charlotte Lefrink. Charlotte? Hi, okay. Um, thank you for the talk, it's very interesting. Um, my question's about the third party adjudication process and whether the adjudicators take into account the state of the clan at the time that someone made a mistake or defected. Like, do they look at the number of cattle that they have currently or the number of deaths in recent past? And do they adjust the rules according to that, the state or not rules, but the level of punishment? Okay, so, um, uh, just to clarify one thing, the, the third part of the talk about the adjudication uh, was all based on theoretical results. Um, so, so far we don't um, have empirical results that um, support, um, we, we are looking into it and in the process of working on that, but all of the results on ATFT that I presented are based on simply examining whether that strategy um, can have higher fitness um, and can be evolutionally stable against plausible invading strategies. Uh, but um, going back to your question about whether um, when people are discussing uh, uh, who to punish, how to punish, to what extent to punish, are they taking into consideration all these factors um, that might be important and relevant? And um, uh, the answer is yes. Um, so uh, usually the time between a wrongdoing occurring and punishment happening is a few days. And during those days, people are constantly talking about what happened and everybody is kind of, you know, either supporting that this person really does need to be punished in another context. I saw this person do the same thing or they're, you know, providing um, information that might alleviate um, uh uh, the crime in some ways and say, okay, this person actually ran out of bullets. I know that this person actually ran away because they had run out of bullets or they'd run out of water or, you know, a deserter, somebody who left the raiding party may have been called back home by his, um, by his parents, etc. So all those factors uh, weigh really heavily into um, the decisions about whether to punish somebody or not. Now, there might have been an aspect to your question that I missed. Uh, if I have, can you, do you want to just um, tell me if I? 
Sure. No, that answers a lot of it. But I guess I'm wondering if there's some kind of higher level monitoring of the group, the state of the group, whether the rules, whether the, the people, the raiders are taking into account, well, there's fewer of us because we a um, number of us were killed recently and we need to do other tasks at the base. Um, so I wonder if the rules somehow aren't are not static and if they change according to that. Yes, for sure. So um, the enforcement of the norm it is affected by circumstances, but also in, in some ways that also means what the norm is, is affected by circumstances that um, uh, it's not that there's a hard and fast rule that people need to be doing X, Y, Z all the time on these raids. There's, um, you know, a lot of discussion about what's the strategy, you know, when people, when we should retreat, etc., or um, uh, discussions about um, how to divide the loot. Um, and it's so there's going to be a lot of variation across raids, um, and uh, so there is in. Uh, uh, but I wouldn't say that necessarily it's planned by some kind of higher order authority. It's more that it's uh, it emerges through the discussions of various people. There are leaders uh, who on raids would help um, kind of create maybe an overall strategic plan. But again, it's actually up to the people to decide whether they want to stick with that plan Um or not. So the leader is somebody who helps advise, but it's not necessarily somebody who's coercing. Um, so in answer, a short answer to your question is, yes, I think uh, the uh, it's not a rigid set of rules about what you should do on RAID, but it's highly informed by the circumstances. Thank you. Thank you, Charlotte. So next we have Jillian. Right. Well, that was really lovely. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, I, I wanted to just maybe you were partly in answer to Charlotte uh, answer. So I wonder if you could, you, you mentioned sort of the Turkana are politically decentralized. So can you say just a little bit more about that? Maybe that's what you're mentioning with there are leaders who could maybe do planning for raids. But um, can you just give me a bit more of a sense of what you mean by that? Yeah. So um, the main kind of um, so in some ways, what I'll say is that by saying that they're politically decentralized, traditionally, the Turkana do not have leaders who have coercive authority, is what I would say. So you have leaders that kind of emerge in different domains. They're not hereditary positions, but, you know, somebody could be an expert and have a lot of skills in um, in uh, knowing where and when to migrate, um, kind of people might think this person can predict the rains. And so when, um, when that person suggests that the settlement migrate to this area, people are not required to follow that, but maybe many of them will. Similarly for raids, there are raid uh, people who are famous raiders, and there are people who are famous diviners, who are people who uh, the Turkana believe um, have dreams in which they are told, you know, where the enemy settlements might be, etc. But um, so the diviners can organize a raid, but it's up to each person to decide whether they want to go on that raid or not. And if somebody violates um, a norm on these raids, it's um, the leader plays doesn't really play a central role in the punishment. It's the age groups, um, the peers of these individuals who are the ones to mobilize for punishment, decide on whether to punish this person, etc. cetera. So, um, so the leaders kind of, I would say, maybe play the role of coordinating, but not of um, enforcing and uh, coercing individuals. And that's happening much more through this um, diffuse social pressure that uh, individuals are experiencing from members of their community, et cetera. So does that- So can I, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so part of, so I was trying to think about this in, in relation to the arbitration function. Um, so it is, so, so, so the arbitration function, is it entirely informal discursive within the group um, so that they 
you know, would discuss whether or not this was a violation, whether that was a coward, whether or not it's appropriate to punch, punish in this time. Um, and it's, it's a matter of like, do we converge after a period of time on a common view? Um, are there rules about how the arbitration works? So are there meta norms about what is, what is fair arbitration to resolve a question like this? Um, so I haven't explored that explicitly, um, but I can, um, so essentially you're saying, uh, are there norms about the, the process of discussing, like the, a certain number of people need to agree or, um, uh, is that, is that right? Are there mm -hmm. meta norms that regulate the process? Um, so um, I, I don't have explicit uh, data on that. Um, there is a lot of, uh, there's some structure to it. Um, uh, so for instance, uh, when a wrongdoing happens in the beginning, it's mostly, you know, there's a lot of talk in the community and that's a time in which, you know, anybody could be talking, you know, the women, um, uh, men, they could be ridiculing or um, criticizing um, someone. But um, as that kind of, you know, either amplifies or settles down, you get maybe the next step in which people decide, okay, it is necessary for us to kind of come together and discuss this. Um, and when they do that, uh, it depends on context. So in raids, it's going to be always the age mates who are supposed to do this, the age mates of the violator, but for other violations, like for stealing, which is the picture that I showed you, that's usually the members from that village, from the community of the thief, the community of the person who was stolen from, who kind of gather together uh, to discuss. Uh, when it's about adultery, it's the clan members of the husband's family who kind of come together um, to discuss the punishment. And, um, uh, basically, you know, people gather under the tree. Um, when it comes to raids, women are usually not part of that, but when it's about stealing, etc., or about adultery, men and women kind of gather together. They, uh, uh, people make sure that the person who's being accused has some voice. So that person is allowed to stand up and talk. Uh, the person who's, you know, been harmed uh, is allowed to stand up and talk and anybody who has information that they want to share with the group at that time is allowed to um, bring up that information kind of thing. Um, and then, you know, they kind of decide on what, what needs to happen. And many times there is a sacrifice of an animal to, uh, as part of that atonement process and part of that punishment process. Does that help? Uh, does that? Yes, get yes. Thing? Yeah, that's actually really interesting to explore. And, and when you said stand under, is there a particular tree or did you, were you just saying they're standing under the tree as a certain no, casual? No, it's usually whenever uh, uh, a tree that gives shade is, okay. is what, you, what you want. But there's not, there's not like an official place that when we were here having a conversation, we were engaged in this activity that's bounded by particular norms about how we have that conversation. No, uh, the look, so the location will be dependent on, on basically who are the parties involved and who are the main people who are kind of gathering together for punishment. So they're gathering under the trees for all kinds of things, including punishment, but, you know, even for meetings, for other conversations, etc., for feasts. Um, Great. Th thanks, Sarah. Brian? <clears throat> yes, thanks. Um, thanks very much. Um, so I have a question. It's a very general question. And so um, I don't know if you want to engage with this or not. It's okay if you want to just say no. Um, but I'm troubled by um, these evolutionary accounts of norms altogether, because it seems to me they seem very, um, I mean, I would say sort of stunningly non-normative. They're it, it's basically a story about behavior and punishment and, um, you know, a kind of might and might makes right sort of account of how these things evolve. Um, so, you know, there's no discussion in your account, it seems to me, of um, normative understanding, any sense of there being good, any sense of 
um, what constitutes the right and the good. There isn't a discussion of realism um, as to whether in fact um, the judgments that people have are true. Although just a footnote there was interesting was you talked about the adjudicator being right. And it wasn't actually clear to me how much, what, what it was for the adjudicator to be right as opposed to simply um, um, decreeing that something was the case. Um, are you troubled by how all the normativity is kind of washed out of these kinds of accounts of normativity, if I can put it in that value-free way? Okay, so um, I, I, I see your point um, that in these accounts, I'm essentially saying that when people um, disapp express dis social disapproval of something, that that's a norm and um, compliance with that norm due to this, these kinds of social pressures are influencing behavior, but a more direct path could just be that you don't have any norms, but people have a uh, kind of morally motivated psychology that recognizes and is attuned to free riding, um, uh, et cetera. And it's simply just, you know, the expression of that psychology in the absence of any cultural norm that's driving, um, a lot of these behaviors. Is that a correct characterization of what you mean by not including? Um... Well, I wouldn't put it that way. I mean, you're saying there wouldn't be a social norm. I would say there would be a social norm, but the social norm is in fact an understanding of values and truth and um, that kind of thing. It, it, so I wouldn't reduce the norm to a behavioral criterion for a norm, but I don't think you know, I don't want to agree with the idea that the norm is behavioral. So I wouldn't say there's no norm. What I would say is that what it is for there to be a norm is a normative thing, not a behavioral. Um, you know, obviously it it leads to behavior. It, it, it um, you know, it may be um, affected in various ways by behavior, but it doesn't prove that the explanation of the behavior can be, um, can be given in language that talks only about behavior, right? It's kind of like the whole story about behaviorism in the 40s and 50s in psychology was you can talk about behavior of people who are rational, but you can't actually give an account of rationality in terms of behavior, that fails. Um, you can't necessarily um, give an account of truth in terms of behavior, even if um, an attempt to be right leads to behavior. So it's a question of whether the regularities that underlie human normative behavior can in fact be cashed out in these behavioral terms. And I'm very suspicious of that, I confess. So, okay. so that's a big cautionary flag for me. Okay, so um, I'm not sure I fully uh, see exactly what you're saying, but I'll just um, uh, say that from the perspective of uh, the, the, the perspective that I'm coming from, what, um, why we are calling this a uh, norm as opposed to, you know, um, uh, something, why we, so it might be that this is not particularly, uh, if I have to talk about the norm, the norm is maybe something that's a little bit more abstract than, um, than this, but uh, we are just saying that uh, there are different um, uh, kind of uh, conventions that, occur in different societies. And so the set of conventions that you see in the Turkana are not necessarily going to be um, what you're gonna find in some other society. And so in some ways, that's what we mean by the fact that this is a norm. And it may not be um, what you mean by what's a norm, but that's, um, uh, that, that's just helping us uh, uh, say that there is a step between um, the moral psychology and what, what uh, people's attitudes are. People's attitudes are informed by um, certain sets of conventions and those conventions can vary across society. So maybe if you don't wanna use the norm for that, maybe you can just replace it with what I just said. Um, one of my uh, students is working a little bit more on understanding the, um, uh, other aspects of a norm. So basically normative uh, judgments, 
uh, not only normative judgments, which has been a lot of my focus, but also uh, uh, normative preferences and normative expectations. Um, so, you know, what do you think others uh, think about um, this? Um, and what would be your preference if it wasn't for, you know, this kind of social pressure? So it gets a little bit more at maybe some of the deeper structures that underlie what I call a norm based on the normative judgments alone. Okay, thank you. Thanks very much. So I don't have a virtual hand, but I do have a question. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. uh, so I'll just muscle my way in here. So uh, this is about, I guess, what we might call second order retribution. So you mentioned early on that, um, that failing to punish um, the violation of a norm is, is disproved of, but there's there is no record of uh, punishment for this um, failure. And you, and you surmise that this was, had to do with the fact that this was an error of omission rather than commission or something like that. But equally, uh, you said that um, excess punishment of the violation of a norm was frowned upon are there observations of these um, excess punishments going punished? Because that's not an error of omission. Yeah. So um, usually when it comes to the uh, excess punishment, uh, people, um, my guess is that they would allow retaliation by those who've been punished. They, you know, they would, either endorse it or not say anything uh, about it. But I haven't, um, I don't yet, I don't know of cases in which people have gathered together to, um, third parties have gathered together to punish somebody who's, uh, or a set of age mates who've been uh, engaging in kind of over punishment. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if that did happen. Um, uh, I, I would be more surprised um, if people punish somebody for failing to punish. Um, so, uh, but I, I do know of cases in which people have, you know, felt like they've been too severely punished and either their family or like, you know, uh, they kind of retaliate against the punisher and people support them when they retaliate. I see, right. So, I mean, it would, does sort of raise the question why um, set violation of a second order norm doesn't elicit the same kind of response that uh, re re retributive response that violation of a first order norm does. Yeah, so why you're not getting the third parties um, uh, to kind of get together and kind of collectively yeah. punish. Um, uh, I, um, I think in theory, I don't have um, you know, theoretically speaking, I don't have a sound reason for why this should um, this should differ, other than the fact that maybe these are rarer events. So, first order violate a certain subset of first order violations um, uh, get verbally sanctioned, and a certain subset of those only end up being um, you know it, you have corporal punishment. Um, and in, it's in the case of corporal punishment that you see mostly the over punishment in which, you know, people get beaten beyond what they should be. Um, and so, you know, maybe only about a fifth or a quarter of the cases of first order violations end up in this territory and even fewer end up in the territory of excess punishment. So uh, the frequency could be one reason why you might need a much larger um, set of observations to document that. Um, and uh, in, in principle, if I'm trying to think about, you know, intuitively what I would expect, um, I'll bring up one example of a first order free writing norm that doesn't get punished because it's a crime of omission, which oh. is, um, which is non-participation in a raid. So uh, uh, when individuals display cowardice on the battlefield or if they deserted, that is they joined the raiding party and along the way they turned back, then uh, those individuals do get sanctioned. But if somebody 
says they don't want to join the raid, they're not going to join the raid. And if they repeatedly are not joining a raid that their age mates are going on, that their age mates have planned, et cetera, um, you, uh, those individuals don't actually get uh, directly sanctioned in the form of punishment. And I think that's because on any given raid, there are reasons why somebody may not be able to go and nobody is required to go on every single raid. You might have herding duties, you might, um, uh, 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 that, that, you know, you can't, uh, leave, um, and you can, and some people are needed for defense, etc. Uh, but there are individuals who have, uh, so in order to detect that there's a pattern of free riding here, you're going to need, you know, to have a lot more information, um, about, you know, the patterns, um, uh, and context under which this individual is refusing to go. And so we don't, uh, the Trakana don't have explicit punishment towards non-contributors, um, uh, even though non-contributors can benefit from the access to the grazing lands. And many times when the animals uh, livestock is brought back, they are shared with their obligations to share with friends, um, within families, within, um, uh, with close friends, et cetera. So that there's a, flow of animals to not just the people who acquired them. Uh, so I think that's maybe one reason to think that the omission versus commission is a um, potential explanation for why the uh, second order free rider um, uh, is not getting punished, but it doesn't fully explain why your um, uh, why the over punishers, why I haven't observed or documented the overpunishment being sanctioned. So maybe I will come back to the low, lower rates. Um, Apple size, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Okay, so we have two questions, Jillian and then Jack. Jillian? Well, you, let's let Jack go ahead. I've, okay, I've had go my ahead, shot Jack. at it. I, have a, I, think a, I think a straightforward question. I just wanted to ask a detail about the arbitration game you have. Um, so the 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 way you modeled the arbitrator, as I understood from the slide, is uh, that it uh, the, the person either uh, the person thinks they're cooperating, but there's a fact of the matter, which is that they 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 haven't, and they've misperceived that, and then the arbitrator uh, recognizes that fact or fails to, um, and. Uh, and I wonder if the like I, I'm I'm thinking about the role that the um, that that framing has already played. I guess this is kind of a, a an attempt to make sense of or an attempt for me to make sense for myself of um, Professor Smith's question because in that framing uh, there's already like a frame of like what is cooperation, what is defection, like there's a there's a thickness there uh, that is kind of hiding in the game theory, uh, like models, um, but there's already like a defined norm, like a linguistic with, with language and stuff, like uh, you know don't don't go hunting at this time or whatever, which suggests a bunch of other cognitive faculties. Sorry, it's, it didn't turn into a question. I thought I had a question because I'm confused. But um, I guess it was uh, was that is that right? You just say is um, that right? At the so end? Um, I, uh, I I don't know whether I've uh, fully understood your question, but um, I will uh, agree with you that um, it, that the perception error problem is a little bit easier in the in the actual game um, structure that we have in the sense that um, there is, you know, there are fixed costs and benefits. There is, um, um, there's a, uh, there's cooperate, there's defect. There's something called cooperate. There's something called defect. Um, and uh, in our models, we are assuming that, you know, mistaken defection is um, uh, one in which the, uh, your partner, so if the focal mistakenly defects, the partner doesn't get the benefit and you didn't pay the cost. 
but you have a different perception. You have a perception that you did cooperate, you did pay the cost and your partner did get that. So that is, um, uh, so in the real world, um, that that might not, it might be even more complicated than that um, to figure out whether, you know, something is a mistaken defection or, um, uh, or was, was really a cooperation because you don't, you, the costs and the benefits can vary so that it can be, you know, sort of a cooperation, sort of a defection. Um, and, um, or it could be that both are right. Um, so suppose you had to go to the airport to pick up your friend, um, you got stuck in traffic, you didn't make it, your friend had to take the taxi back home. It's not that you haven't paid the cost, you have paid the cost, you've sat in traffic all this time, but your friend has also paid the cost. Um, so there are a lot of um, situations that are assumed away in, um, in, the, frame, in the framework that um, we have of perception errors. But this is, it's a simplification that helps to illustrate what can happen when two players don't have the same beliefs about what happened, but somebody else can step in and say, okay, I think this person did the right thing. Thank you very much. I think we have time for a quick question from Jillian. All right, well, it's just, it's just an intervention along the same lines also in response to Brian's comment. And I think this is all related because I do think that this, the, the disagreement uh, can be, can be uh, normative norm in, in the way that Brian is using normative, right? To say, that, I mean, I, I think, um, you know, even when you, you look at your descriptions of how people account for what is a coward and so that's a, that's a system of reasoning. And I think Brian, you're when you're using the language of normative, you're thinking of, we have a structured system of reasoning and I give reasons for why this is or is not a violation. And that in fact, the, the, the arbitration effort, which is in this politically decentralized environment is discursive, is the group under the tree talking, right? I also think that might be related to why you, you should not punish alone, because if you're punishing alone, you, you haven't got the benefit of, at least there's been some discursive agreement. And, and I think, so I, I don't see, I mean, it's behavioral, yes, but it is not behavioral in the sense of a norm is just what people are doing and what people punish, it's what can actually be embedded in this exchange of reasons and that normative structure. And the fact that there's this elaborate set of narratives about, and, and that you can, you can elicit, Sarah, you know, it would be appropriate, it would be inappropriate to punish, to not punish in these circumstances. This counts as being a coward that doesn't, uh, you, you just express there, you know, there may be lots of reasons you don't go on the raid and, and so on. So I actually do see it as, as quite, uh, the, the fact that it's attached to that discursive element and a group discursive and, and the ways in which the rules are structured around that. So, so that's not a question either. That's just, um, that's just an observation. I, I think uh, uh, in, partly in response to, to Brian as well. Well, whatever you said makes total sense to me. Um, <laughs> and, but I, I, uh, I, I uh, in light of this, maybe um, you all can help me think about what would you, what kind of data you, you would like to see if you were to be convinced that you know this is normative behavior. So I'm I'm actually just thinking, Dennis. We we want it. We we like to end promptly, but the, those of us who'd like to stay on and continue this conversation can can do so as if we were in a real seminar room. And oh, oh yeah, I didn't keep track of the time. Yeah. Yes. Let's say our thank yous and goodbyes, and those of us who want to hang out out in the room could do so a little bit. Is that right? Is that the way yes. we should go? So that sounds good. And 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 also to to, to say that Brian will be our speaker next week. So um, he he on, will indeed entitled. Uh, effing the ineffable, what AI teaches us about what can and cannot be said, where we one must remain silent, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, okay. Sure. So, so anyway, so those of us who'd like to stay, great. Please join me in thanking Sarah very, very much for the wonderful, engaging talk. And anybody who wants to hang out can do so. Thanks very much, Sarah. Thank you so much Thanks, for the invitation. This was. Bye. Bye bye. Great. <laughs>